welcome. We will call the March 18th meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission to order. Can we have the roll call, please? Andre Spinelli. Here. Jared Gardner. Here. Radhika Krishna. Here. Jim Winchester. Here. Scott Pullis. Here. Brandy Eber. Here. Daniel George. Here. Greg Strike. Here. Jeff Ron is excused. You have a quorum. Thank you. Next, we have disclosures. Are there any commissioners that have any items to disclose? Uh, through the chair, I uh, just want to disclose that I did receive a presentation of uh, the home initiative by the sponsors that was given in a public forum uh, on March 5th to the Anchorage Home Builders Association. Uh, it was a large, widely attended event. I just want to put that on the record that I did have a chance to hear that presentation. I will also disclose that I also attended that presentation. Okay, we will, I'll first read the public process for uh, public hearing. The procedure by which the public may speak to the commission at its meetings is after the staff's presentation is completed on public hearing items, the chair will ask for public testimony on the issue. Persons who wish to testify will follow the time limits established in the commission rules and procedures. Petitioners, <coughs> including all his or her representatives will receive 10 minutes. Part of this time may be reserved for rebuttal. Representatives of groups, community councils, PTAs, etc., will receive five minutes. Individuals will receive three minutes. When your testimony is complete, you may be asked questions by the commission. You may only testify once on any issue unless questioned by the commission. Any party of interest wishing to appeal shall first file with the planning director within seven days of the commission's decision made on the record a written notice of intent to appeal in accordance with AMC 2103050A4A. Commission recommendations to the Anchorage Assembly are not appealable. Can we please have staff presentation on case 2024-0006? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening. I'd like to introduce those present with me here tonight. Um, there's myself, Ryan Yell. I'm the Long Range Planning Manager. I'm also joined by Craig Lyon, Planning Director, Tom Davis, Senior Planner, and Allison Baljano, who is the Assistant Municipal Attorney representing the Municipality of Anchorage. I'd like to thank the Commission for their review of the extensive materials and commend the sponsors of the Home Initiative for their dedicated work to progress zoning reforms aimed at reducing our housing shortage within the municipality. Anyone who has recently purchased or rented a home can attest that it is difficult to obtain housing across the municipality and even more difficult to find housing that justifies its price tag. The planning department wholeheartedly agrees that the concept, with the concept that land use code should be simple to implement, flexible enough to address unforeseen challenges, and should promote the general welfare. However, during our review of the home initiative, it became apparent to us that there are several practical, legal, and ethical concerns regarding its scope, direction, and implementation. I assure you, these concerns are not insurmountable, and they can be addressed through collaborative work with the Planning Department, Planning and Zoning Commission, and the community. The home initiative will affect every current and future resident of Anchorage, and we owe it to them to provide a land use code that is functional, and balances both community needs and desires. We are all anxious to solve this problem. We all want it fixed yesterday, but we must solve it in a manner that is legal, practical, and respectful of our community. Lastly, just one housekeeping clarification. My initials do not appear on the staff report because I was not physically present in the office due to a family emergency when the final hard copy of the staff report was routed for initials. However, I want to clarify that I fully support the findings and recommendation within the report. I'll now turn the floor over to Tom Davis, who will dive further into our analysis. Uh, good evening, Tom Davis, Planning Department. I'm going to briefly go over a summary of the proposed amendment as the staff 
reviewed it, uh, a analysis of consistency with the Title 21 text amendment approval criteria, and then the uh, recommendations of the department. Uh, summary of the proposed amendment. The materials for review, the assembly initiated this proposed text amendment in September, referring draft AO 2023-87S, which is attachment two in your case packet, to the Planning and Zoning Commission for a public hearing and PZC's recommendation. Following the assembly's action in September, the sponsors created a revised version of the draft ordinance, the sponsor's version dated 1-12-2024, and requested that be included in the materials for public review. So that's attachment four in your packet. Attachment four has not been reviewed by the full assembly and was not a part of their referral. Therefore, Planning and Zoning Commission action on the sponsor's revised version is not being requested by the assembly. However, the assembly's referred version, the S version and attachment two of your packet is incomplete. It does not show what changes to the allowed uses or development standards would be in most of the zones being amended. To deduce what the potential changes for property owners might be, uh, staff over the past uh, month or so has identified the most likely options for what would happen and inferred from other parts of the case packet, including from attachment for the sponsor's January 112 version and from other publicly available information from the sponsors. So the, the staff report uses those other sources as indicators of the most likely scenarios for what changes in land use, intensity, and scale would follow from the 2023-87S in attachment two. And the staff report throughout refers to those as implied changes that the assembly's referred version would be likely to refer to after further amendments by the assembly, uh, such as uh, S version or floor amendments. Summary of the amendments, uh, as the staff report um, found it proposes condense 15 existing residential zones of the Anchorage Bowl into five consolidated zoning districts, reclassifying the zones and revising the content of their land use regulations. It essentially, three groups of mergers, five urban low density zones condensed into two, four medium and high density multifamily zones condensed into two, and then six uh, hillside area zones condensed into one new zone. It is a far reaching change to the land use regulation uh, affects nearly all residentially zoned properties in the bowl and a more detailed overview for each zone is uh, provided on pages three through eight of the staff report. What's not included, uh, the staff report on page nine identifies unaffected areas of the municipality. Uh, also it notes that uh, AO 2023-87S does not change the permitting review and approval processes for new housing projects or reuse or adapt or reuse, or have any bearing on how long it takes a proposed development to get approval for a land use permit. The draft amendment does not include a zoning map amendment or a rezoning. Uh, the planning department believes the actions proposed in the ordinance constitute a rezoning, also based on uh, advice from the legal department. Uh, this is because they would erase boundaries of zoning districts and reclassify zoning classifications of parcels of land uh, throughout the bowl. Uh, the text amendment needs to be accompanied by a proposed zoning map amendment, a public hearing draft that would come before the Planning and Zone Commission that requires, uh, even if provided concurrently, provided, it would need to provide its own public hearing. Uh, rezoning notice, uh, the staff report notes that notice would be mailed to approximately 60,000 property owners, residentially zoned land, a clarification that that would also need to be noticed to all residents in affected parcels such as uh, tenant households and apartments and mobile homes. Also, all property owners 
of non-residentially zoned properties within 500 feet. So we don't know, but a guess uh, or a conservative estimate might be 100,000 notices. Uh, moving to the analysis of consistency with the comprehensive plan approval criteria, the assembly can approve uh, a Title 21 text amendment if all three approval criteria are met. First, uh, proposed text amendment must promote the public health, safety, and welfare. The standard is partially met, we found, in the low density urban residential zones at the R1 and R2 level, that the reform of single family only zoning districts to allow more housing opportunities is a promising direction. However, it, that, at that level, it did not address where natural hazards, infrastructure limitations, or critical environmental features may make such increases inappropriate and uh, merits adjustment. Secondly, in the multifamily and large lot hillside zones, uh, the standard is not met. In the multifamily zones, it, and the hillside zones, the department finds that the ordinance does not appear likely to result in a net gain of housing opportunities. And uh, like in the single family areas, does not consider where there are natural or technological hazards or infrastructure limitations. Uh, it, unlimited commercial entitlements in uh, multifamily areas could result in a strategic loss of residential land supply and housing stock. And so adjustments uh, uh, should be uh, made in those areas. It, in the hillside, it reduces minimum lot sizes in the higher elevation upper hillside zones, but increases minimum lot size in lower hillside and uh, in the, uh, the public hearing draft that we reviewed in, in Abbott Loop as well, and that's that R5 zone that seems to be moving uh, maybe in play. The second approval criteria is that a uh, proposed text amendment must be consistent with the comprehensive plan. Uh, we found that the standard is not met as the plan is currently adopted. The public hearing draft ordinance conflicts with multiple elements and policies of the comprehensive plan. Although some elements of the proposed ordinance support additional housing, most of its proposals are in contention with the policies and the land use plan map of the 2040 land use plan and other elements of the comp plan. Some proposals seem to run counter to retaining a stable supply of residentially zoned lands in the multifamily zones. The comprehensive plan is a living document and it's made to be amended. A public process to amend the comprehensive plan would be necessary to support most of the proposals in the draft ordinance. The process of amending the plan first or concurrently and bringing a public hearing draft amendment to the comprehensive plan to the Planning and Zoning Commission first or concurrently can support the home initiative and the residential zoning reforms under consideration. As called for in policy 1.8 of the 2040 land use plan, such plan amendments must engage Anchorage residents and property owners in a predictable and transparent process of amending the comprehensive plan. And that process is laid out in code. The relationship of the comprehensive plan to zoning regulation amendments is mandatory. Approval criteria two reflects that Alaska law and the Anchorage Municipal Charter established that municipal land use regulations, such as zoning ordinance reforms and rezonings, must follow the comp plan. These legal requirements reflect that it makes the most sense to arrive at a solution after first making the diagnosis and setting the direction in the comprehensive plan amendment. Uh, in the meat of the review of the, the, the comprehensive plan consistency, uh, we first touch on the consistency with the Anchorage 2040 land use plan map, then with the neighborhood land use plan maps, 
and then touch quickly on the policies. On the land use plan map, the public hearing draft and the accompanying AM, which was provided in your packet, the AM is actually an attachment one at the very end, and it briefly describes the uh, approach of the home initiative. The public hearing draft ordinance and the AM uh, misinterpret the direction of the 2040 land use plan map and its color-coded land use designation categories. The land use designations of the land use plan map provide broad categories of land use to illustrate general development intensity. And primarily it does that for visual simplicity and ease of interpretation so they are really a generalized representation of the land use long-term plan. And the land use plan map does not support each of its land use designations becoming one zoning district each. Uh, figure 1-2 on page 6 of the 2040 plan visualizes how the land use plan map rolls up multiple zoning districts into a few broader residential categories so that the zoning map remains a more detailed, flexible blueprint so that there are more zoning district options than there are land use plan map designations. In its intro to the land use plan map, on page 29, the 2040 land use plan map defines how its land use designation categories relate to zoning, and it reads, most every land use designation has a corresponding set of zoning districts which can be used to implement it. This allows for a range of possible zoning densities to reflect the site and surrounding area. The area's land use designation does not imply that the most intense corresponding zoning district is necessarily the most appropriate for every parcel. So for good or bad, that's the adopted land use plan. And I was the lead author on that project and the lead on the design of the land use plan map. And uh, I can tell you that it was a different time pre-COVID seven years ago. And I can tell you the thought wasn't there. The anticipation or support for uh, the kinds of change uh, isn't there in the plan. The plan is made to be amended and updated. It does not anticipate nor support a merger of the R1 zones with the R2 zones, permitting duplexes throughout the existing single family. It just doesn't. The plan does not support or indicate any rationale for converting all multifamily zoned areas into mixed use zones, allowing unlimited commercial entitlement on a property, uh, nor does it support merging the hillside zones. So it is a departure from the land use plan map as currently adopted, and uh, the planning department recommends a, a public process to amend the land use plan. The uh, neighborhood and district plans do delineate single family detached land use designations. So the public hearing draft ordinance further conflicts with the neighborhood and district plan elements of the comprehensive plan. So, for example, the 2040 land use plan map, single family and two family land use designation, it's, it defers to five area specific district and neighborhood plans, including the east, west district plans and several other plans that each delineate on their land use plan maps, single family detached neighborhoods separately from two family areas on their land use plan maps. And it defers to them. In these cases, these area specific delineations of the single family detached areas separately, they apply as the comprehensive plans governing land use plan map designation in most cases. Uh, and so it's more than about the 2040 and in interpreting uh, its, its map. It, it really is uh, further in those plans. And, and so we would recommend amendments addressing uh, those issues as well to the comprehensive plan. Lastly, consistency with the comprehensive plan policies. 
Uh, they are listed and discussed in the staff report, but briefly, uh, for the record, that, that the public hearing draft conflicts with Anchorage 2020 policies 5, 14, 41, 49, 57, and 72. It conflicts with Anchorage 2040 land use plan policies 1.1, 1 1.4, 1 1.5, 1 1.6, 1 1.8, 2.1, 4.1, 4.4, 5.1, 7.1, 7.2. .1, so that is the, 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 the comprehensive plan as currently adopted. And again, it's a living document. Uh, and and uh, we're there with the uh, assembly members and community and understanding that the land use plan map should be updated to reflect current needs. Uh, the last approval criteria is that a uh, Title 21 amendment must be necessary or desirable because of changing conditions, new planning concepts, or socioeconomic conditions. The planning department finds that the standard is partially met that reforming single-family only zoning has emerged as an important strategy both nationally and locally that can help provide the kind of home ownership opportunities needed by contemporary households today and in the future. It would also be beneficial to update the residential zoning regulations uh, to allow more neighborhood scale commercial and non-residential uses and accessory commercial uses and home-based businesses in the residential zones and, and not only in the multifamily zones. Uh, the multifamily zones are only 10% of the land supply of urban residential zone land. However, the reforming Title 21 to integrate commercial uses into neighborhoods should be a thoughtful, transparent, focused, and well-informed reform effort. It should be accompanied by new provisions in Title 21 to mitigate impacts on residential neighborhoods, neighbors, uh, glare, lighting, noise, et cetera. And also to limit the size of the commercial uses to the neighborhood scale and uh, to uh, the scale, the area, rather than copy or expand commercial entitlements in the R3A and R4A zones, which were designed for a different purpose. As page 8 of the 2040 land use plan explains, the biggest land policy risk facing the municipality is to make land use decisions that result in inadequate residential land supply in this constrained land market. Quote, such a scenario would make the current land capacity shortages and housing prices worse. And in fact, the 2040 plan did call for increasing residential uses in commercial zones, like the CIHA developments that we find in the B3. That's along the lines of the 2040 plan. But the 2040 plan explains that is not enough, that we must also double down on residential uses, increasing residential opportunities in the multifamily zones, that the B3 housing is welcome, but it's not enough. Uh, lastly, staff recommendation. The home initiative, uh, we believe, sets a good direction and is an important reform. And instruction is uh, good, at least in concept. However, the Planning Department recommends the Planning and Zoning Commission postpone action on the public hearing draft ordinance to allow the Assembly and Municipality to revise and bring back the proposed text amendment before the Planning and Zoning Commission for a public hearing including taking the actions in accordance with page uh, 32, excuse me, 33 of the staff report to just briefly accompany the revised public hearing draft with a public hearing draft comprehensive plan amendment following the procedure of AMC 2103060 comprehensive plan amendments. Secondly, to accompany the public hearing draft title 21 text amendment with a zoning map amendment, a rezoning following the procedure for rezoning in AMC 2103-160 rezonings. And lastly, 
to revise the Title 21 text amendment using the framework provided on page 34 of the staff report. Uh, in conclusion, the planning department is available and ready to work with the assembly, the community, on in improving and moving forward this ordinance so that we bring forward to the Planning and Zoning Commission an ordinance that works for the municipality, works with the Title 21 code and the comprehensive plan. Staff here this evening is present to assist and, and answer questions and just leaving off uh, comments received. Attachment five in your packet contains comments received as of the time the staff report was written and sent to the commission. Uh, to supplementary packet one contains additional comments received last week. Supplementary packet two provides comments received as of 1.05 p.m. this afternoon. <laughs> uh, substantive comments uh, come from two public review agencies, including the Municipal Project Management and Engineering Department and the Right-of-Way Enforcement Division. Uh, comments from four neighborhood organizations, including HALO, and those include three resolutions and then comments from 27 individuals. And uh, I think turn back to the chair unless somebody has anything to add from the staff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Are there any questions for staff? Commissioner Krishna. Um, I'll start since we have somebody from the Muni's legal department here and it sounds like uh, legal has uh, weighed in. Um, I will just ask uh, what legal considerations the municipality would like us to be aware of. Yes, um, so I would say, let me, uh, to provide a summarized list. Um, Sorry. Please state your name. Oh, yes. Sorry, it's my first time at one of these. I'm Alison Boljano. I'm an assistant municipal attorney with the municipality of Anchorage, uh, representing the municipality. And so first would be uh, consistency with the comprehensive plan. This is a requirement of Alaska state law um, and the Alaska Supreme Court uh, in a decision specific to Anchorage has said that the municipality of Anchorage that zoning regulations must comply with its comprehensive plan um, and um, to have um, zoning regulations or a zoning decision that doesn't comport with a comprehensive plan could set the municipality up for um, legal challenges and it just frustrates the purpose of a comprehensive plan which is to use a public process to set the direction of land use and to engage the public in uh, creating that governing vision. Um, the next issue um, of concern is uh, that the, the ordinance um, in a de facto sense effectuates a rezoning, yet right now there's not a uh, change to the official zoning map being presented to you all um, or to the public um, and that the public processes as the assembly notes in their memo that they um, submitted just tonight um, there are small but uh, there are differences in the public process for a rezoning versus a title 21 text amendment and one of those is the mailed notice to um, property owners and residents, whether they own property or not in the municipality. So there are those public process differences and um, have giving the public the opportunities that code affords them to receive notice and participate is a concern. Um, and I would say that lastly, um, there are to the extent that the ordinance um, creates implementation, if, if it were to create implementation challenges as the planning staff brought up in their report, those could easily become 
legal issues, um, if we have an ordinance that, if Title 21, if it's hard to know what set of dimension regulations or setback standards apply to parcels, um, it seems like it could be very difficult for our planning staff to evaluate, do site plan review or consider variances, conditional use permits. So I would say those are the big three. May I follow up? Uh, just to follow up, it sounds like a comprehensive plan amendment brought forward simultaneously with a version of this ordinance that was being voted upon would satisfy the requirement that this would, you know, must be in compliance or in accordance with the comprehensive plan? Yes. Um, comprehensive plan amendments can be brought forward simultaneously with rezoning. Um, legislation or applications. So those can be simultaneous. Uh, there are differences in the public process um, under Title 21.03, so just be important that um, those public process procedures are followed. But yes, we could, could have a world where uh, we, the public's engaged, comprehensive plan amendments are written, those come before you all, um, and then they are simultaneously considered and ultimately can be voted on potentially in even the same assembly meeting down the line. One more follow-up. And uh, to the second point you raised about the zoning map um, um, that would be brought forward if we were to proceed with the implementation of this Title 21 text amendment, there's no timeline required, is there? I do not believe there's a, there's no timeline in, in code. I think the consideration, I think an important consideration though would be implementation challenges. If you have a text amendment that reduces the municipality from having 15 residential zones to five, but the official zoning map hasn't been redrawn, um, so, no, code doesn't say these things need to happen within 90 days of each other, uh, but I think the implementation challenges would be the impetus for um, perhaps doing them simultaneously. Thank you. Commissioner Polis. In, in this packet they provided, they discussed this being an area-wide rezone legally and that that was a different legal situation. Do you have any insight into that? And, you know, they'll get to answer that question too, but do you know anything about that comment? I guess, Tom, oh, I'm No, you, you should go ahead, Tom. Perhaps I'll start with the history and then I'll stay away from the legal side. But, uh, history, uh, the municipality has conducted area-wides over history and institutional memory of the department is that we conducted a series of area-wide rezonings in Chugach, Eagle River and outlying parts of the bowl, former Greater Anchorage area borough parts of you know, the municipality in the 1970s and 80s. And in that case, the municipality decided to move forward with uh, determining zoning for uh, broad sectors um, in a series of area-wides and each area-wide covered a large area. And in those cases, those area-wide rezonings, they're just rezonings. They follow the rezoning process. And so you have notice, you have the, the process. And the 2040 land use plan recommends what we call targeted area rezonings, which are like little area-wides and uh, we have not carried out any of those yet, uh, but those are also rezonings, and that's where the municipality, again, would be facilitating rezoning uh, to, for uh, an area more than you know, one property, but maybe a neighborhood or part of town. The uh, most recent area-wide type rezoning was in Girdwood in 2005, 
when we rezone Gird Wood from its old zone into the uh, 29 zones or so that it is today. And that also uh, followed the rezoning process in which provided notice to all Girdwood area residents and property owners. And that's uh, our history and track record with area-wise. Um, this uh, ordinance implementation would not be the first area-wide. It would be the largest, but it would not be the first. And that's our precedent. Thank you. Just quick follow-up to that. The historical um, area-wide rezones, were those kind of pushed by planning and zoning and you guys, or was that more an assembly push back then, if you recall? Yeah, according to the lawyer of the planning department, someone decided that we didn't have time to amend the land use plan before we went into the area-wise. We don't have time to amend the plan. We need to just go ahead and get you know the job done where the rubber meets the road and get this uh, city zoned. Uh, and so we were going to quickly do a series of area-wides. So we did not uh, precede the area-wide rezoning with a, with a plan amendment at the time. Um, it became a 12-year journey, kind of like the Gilligan's Island, uh, in part because of that. So it's kind of a hurry-up-and-wait situation. At the time, the municipality, uh, well, the Greater Anchorage Borough, there wasn't zoning. There wasn't zones, and so they, they moved forward with that. Um, so I'm not sure I answered your question. But, uh, okay. Any further questions for staff? Okay, we will now invite the petitioners to come up. Ten minutes and you can save any time for rebuttal. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Meg Zalatel. I'm joined with the co-sponsors Daniel Voland and Anna Brawley of the Home Initiative. Anchorage needs housing. That is not in dispute. And in fact, I really appreciated the comments by Mr. Yell. We are in quite a bit of philosophical alignment. The question is, how do we get there? We believe the Home Initiative provides that 50,000 foot view on uh, what we need to do, why we need housing. What we need to do is the home initiative. It is one of a plethora of pieces of policy reform the Anchorage Assembly is working on. It is not the silver bullet on creating more housing, but it will help. What I heard tonight through the staff report in particular isn't that we have a um, difference of specific opinion about something needing to change. What we have provided with the home initiative is the catalyst for that change. And the way we have provided that is by not only providing the broad policy strokes in the S version, but then filling in those details in that draft document you have. We wanted to shore up the uncertainty. And we did that after consulting with the planning department and the mayor's office, um, hearing that they would not have the time and capacity currently to put those things forward. So we did that work. Um, and that is the work we've been out talking to the public about. Now, I think it's really important we highlight a few things. Um, Mr. Davis mentioned seven years ago was when the land use plan map was last updated, but we haven't seen any up zones since then. So again, what we're trying to do is take these best parts of what's in the land use map, what we know the goals and objectives of the comprehensive plan to be, and catalyze those into action. We hear comp plan amendment is needed, a land use plan is, uh, map is needed. We know these things. We plan to, um, what we want to work with the planning department to bring those things forward. Um, I, we still disagree. This is not a rezone. We are not an applicant for a parcel-based rezone. Those rules are not the rules that apply here. 
Um, additionally, the land use plan amendment won't be a redrawing of the boundaries. It will be a substitution of the zoning districts in the current land use designations, right? The land use designations are there, those boundaries are drawn. You're going to simply turn those land use designations into the consolidated zoning districts. So um, what I hope you hear tonight is there is more in common than not, and that there are paths forward. And a lot of them are direction and recommendations by this body about how to achieve the shared goal of creating a policy reform that gives us another toolbox in our, um, our tool in our toolbox to increase housing supply in Anchorage. I'd like to reserve the remaining time. Are there any questions for the petitioner? I, I don't see any that I forgot to ask, so. <clears throat> we'll now invite the public up to, oh, so wait. We are gonna take the phone testimony first. Hello? Oh, hello. Hello, is this Donovan Camp? Yeah, this is him. Yeah, good evening, uh, Mr. Camp. This is the Planning and Zoning Commission calling for public testimony on case 2024-0006. Are you testifying this evening as an individual or representing a group? Uh, as an individual. All right, thank you. As an individual, you have three minutes to testify. Please state your full name for the record and please begin your testimony. All right, my name is Donovan Camp. All right, yeah, I'm calling to testify in support of the Home Initiative. I see the Home Initiative as, initiative as part of a movement to simplify and reduce barriers to housing created by over-prescribing zoning. By doing this, the initiative will increase the number and accessibility to homes in Anchorage. Like many cities in the US, Anchorage has an extreme housing stock problem. Zoning code changes that are less prescriptive, like home, allow for greater options when building homes and adding additions. Anchorage needs less top-down regulation in how our town evolves. It's exactly this over-regulation that has gotten us to, and other cities into this predicament. Zoning reform of this type has been very successful in other cities. They've increased their housing at scale, or at all scales, and in doing so, have stabilized the rent and home prices over, over time. This is an express goal of our community. The Anchorage I see today is one that many of my professional peers are struggling to find affordable places to live in. It's one where homelessness is just that much closer to those who are struggling, where many folks are finding that housing in Anchorage is too expensive to be worth the perks of our urban space and leaving. I see, the connected, uh, I see the connection to our city struggling to build new homes, especially at the rates that will make an, the impacts that we need. This status quo has to change, and our current zoning code with it. Our current, our current plan for zoning has good goals and ideas. I've heard from some of the proponents uh, of the status, the status quo that the plan is the original Strong Towns methodology. But this top-down prescription of land use is fundamentally not in line with the Strong Towns movement. The founder, Chuck Rowan, actually spoke directly about this current plan and in a tweet not long ago uh, tweeted that this is not representative of the Strong Towns movement. Uh, home reform, or homes reform is gentle. It's a small step towards increasing the rates of housing that we build here in Anchorage and can build. So I'm asking for the PZT, or PZ, Planning and Zoning Commission, to support this direction of zoning reform. I hope that the committee encourages the plan 
to reach farther in reducing the overprescriptiveness of our zoning codes. I'd like to see items like allowing fourplexes and other proven pro-housing reform strategies be recommended. Uh, home Initiative has uh, made me excited for the future of home, and I thank the committee for their time. Thank you. Thank you. Are, are there any questions from the commission? All right, thank you for your time. We have no questions. Thank you. Hello, good evening. Is this John Riley? Yes. Good evening, Mr. Riley. This is the Planning and Zoning Commission calling for a public testimony in case 2024-0006. Are you testifying as an individual or representative of a group? Uh, I'm a co-chair of the Rabbit Creek Community Council. All right, so will you, will you be speaking on behalf of the Rabbit Creek Community Council this evening? Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Riley, a member of the audience has requested you speak as an individual. Uh, we just would like to clarify, are you speaking as an individual or as a uh, representative of Rabbit Creek Community Council? Um, I, I can speak as an individual as well. It's fine. All right. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Uh, as an individual, you will have three minutes to testify. Please state your full name for the record, and you may begin your testimony. Uh, my name is John Riley, and uh, I'm testifying today in support of increasing the availability of affordable housing in Anchorage. Uh, for success in ensuring an adequate supply of affordable housing, we first have to agree on a common definition of affordable. And thankfully, the Anchorage Assembly has given us an answer to that question by providing an illustrated example in their slideshow um, promoting uh, AO 87S. The illustration shows a new ASD teacher, Mr. Lewis, and calculates what he can afford for rent at 30% of his after-tax income. Mr. Lewis's ASD salary is $55,168. 30% of his after-tax income, or $1,076, is available for his monthly rent. The price range for a two-bedroom apartment shown in Mr. Lewis's school neighborhood on the Anchorage map, which is included in the illustration, is $1,500 to $1,800 per month. The challenge here for Mr. Lewis is that the market rate within three miles of his school is uh, about 28% higher than what is considered affordable rent for his family. Mr. Lewis's ASD salary is too high to qualify for subsidized Section 8 housing. Uh, but Mr. Lewis is then caught in the middle between not qualifying for federally subsidized housing and uh, being able to meet the affordability target of 30% of his after-tax income. So increasing the supply of affordable housing by redesigning zoning and construction standards is the paramount driver of the upzoning movement uh, that's been sweeping across U.S. cities. And upzoning has stimulated some housing construction in some U.S. cities. However, a 2023 literature review published by Yona Freeman in the Journal of Planning and Literature found that upzoning efforts offer mixed success in terms of housing production, reduced costs, and social integration in impacted neighborhoods. Is it feasible that passing 87S will be sufficient to solve the significant affordability gap experienced by Mr. Smith and allow his family and the thousands of Anchorage households with after-tax incomes under $60,000 to 
to realize the American dream of affordable housing? Can market forces drive Anchorage market prices for high-quality, energy-efficient housing down to an affordable level for families like Mr. Lewis while retaining acceptable returns for developers? AO 87S in current form does not appear to provide a clear mechanism to achieve our definition I'm, I'm of I'm sorry, affordability. your time is up. Are there any questions so, from the commission? Commissioner Krishna. Sure, <clears throat> sure. If you would like to finish that last uh, thought that you were in the middle of uh, conveying, that would be great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I suggest that before Anchorage proceeds with major changes to our current zoning and land use plan, we collect detailed data and analysis uh, of our current housing capacity by price, type, location, and how it matches to affordability standards for the current and projected populations of Anchorage. Once that data is established, we will need core metrics to measure our success. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any further questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Good night. Okay, thank you. All right, now we're ready for in-person testimony. Please step up and state your name for the record. Hi, my name is David Evans. I'm speaking on behalf of myself. Go ahead. I endorse the Rabbit Creek Community Council's written comments, and I endorse and I'm going to read uh, Rogers Park Community Council's resolution that was adopted at their September 11th, 2023 meeting. It goes like this. Whereas, one of the proposals in the home initiative is a zoning change to allow two family dwellings that is duplexes in R1 zones throughout the Anchorage Bowl. Whereas the home initiative um, states, that it, states that it directly implements the 2040 land use plan, but in fact that is false. The 2040 land use plan specifically states that it does not recommend a bowl wide rezoning. That's on page 75. And it appears that the home initiative would appear to do that. Um, it says that this, quote, single family and two family areas are to have R1, er sorry, the land use plan says that it's, quote, single family and two family, unquote, areas are to have R1 areas with single family dwellings at a density of three to five housing units per gross acre, that's on page 37, as well as separate R2 areas. Whereas most of the Rogers Park Community Council area is zoned R1, and the Rogers Park subdivision has an approximate density of four units per gross acre, which is in the middle of the land use plan's three to five range, the number of units, acre would be, number of units per acre would be larger if ADUs are counted, but Title 21 states that ADUs not contribute to density. My personal comment is, is in fact, of course, in reality, ADUs do c contribute to density. Back to the resolution. Title 21 specifies maximum building heights and lot coverages in typical homes in Rogers Park do not reach those maximums. The proposed changes would increase the incentive for people to construct new larger buildings that do reach those maximums, and any such new large structures are likely to significantly adversely affect adjacent neighbors' solar access and privacy, as well as neighborhood character. Whereas without ordinance changes to limit short-term rentals, this initiative will likely also increase the incentive to construct buildings buildings that are used as non-owner occupied short-term rentals, whereas earlier this year, and that was 2023 in this resolution, the regulations for ADUs were revised to promote their construction with the intent to increase Anchorage's affordable housing supply. Whereas due to the cost of construction and other factors, the proposed changes in the Rogers Park area are unlikely to significantly increase Anchorage's supply of housing especially not affordable housing. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Rogers Park Community Council believes it is appropriate for the recent ADU changes to play out before new R1 zoning changes are considered and opposes the proposed zoning change that would allow duplexes in R1 areas in Rogers Park. And I would also like to say that the proponent's recent statement that this is not a rezone and they're just going to substitute one zoning map for another from a practical perspective, sure sounds like a rezone to me. Thank you. Are there any questions? I see no questions. Can I give you a copy of the Rogers Park resolution for the record?
Um, I, we believe that we have the resolution in our comments received. Is that staff, is that Tom? Well, you can bring it up just in case. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up. Hello. Um, my name is Jacob Powell, and I live in Anchorage, and um, I'm speaking on behalf of myself. I'd like to tell a story and paint a picture of this situation, but before I do, I want to bring up a concept that I feel is key to this conversation, and that's the housing ladder. Oftentimes, people that both support and don't support upzoning, such as the Home Initiative, criticize the lack of affordable housing that's being built as a result of upzoning. But as an example of how we all move up the housing ladder, my partner wants a goat and my townhouse, I can't have a goat in my backyard. So eventually I'm gonna sell my relatively affordable home, buy a larger one so I can have a goat. And then I move up the ladder and then more people move up. So every unit of housing that we build that's allowed by things such as the home initiative helps everyone in the community. And there's currently a deep division in Anchorage and that's not Republican, Democrat, that's not ideological. It's between homeowners and those who don't own homes. And I feel like this is incredibly important to how you're considering this testimony. I'm incredibly unfortunate to live in a townhouse that I own in Midtown Anchorage. But if any of you on this commission don't own your home or are not in a long-term rental situation with a stable landlord, I'd really encourage you to speak with those that you know that may not have this going for them. People such as myself, homeowners, have a direct financial interest in making sure that no more housing is built, that no one else can own a home because every single home that's not built is an increase in my own property value. It's a heart-wrenching disappointment to think that the fact that I bought my home for $250,000 and it's now worth $300,000 is somehow a benefit to me, but I have friends who want to buy homes that are adjacent to mine that can't because of that increase in cost. And I, like I said, I think this dynamic is really important to consider when you think about this testimony and the fact that people, young people such as myself, we can't live here. I am I'm one of a million. I'm so fortunate to have, be able to own a home, but so many of my friends, they're moving out of town. They're staying in places that aren't tenable because they can't find a better place to live. We need more teachers. We need more electricians. We need more everything in this city. And we're at a tipping point with our labor, with our housing and everything. It's all tied together. And if we don't take steps such as this to increase the supply of housing, to take the pressure off of the market, we're just gonna keep going downhill as a city and as a state. And there's no fix for that that isn't building more homes. It's, it's critical to everything. I don't think this is a perfect initiative. I'd like to see three triplexes and fourplexes included. I don't think this is the final step. Just as the co-sponsors said, this is the beginning of a process. This is a part of a process towards more homes, more density, and making the dream of home ownership and stability more affordable for everyone. And I thank you for your time, and I really want you to consider that um, as you think about all of uh, Wait. Oh, yeah, sorry. I come, question from yep. Commissioner George. Yep. Through the chair, thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you for your incredibly uh, insightful and articulate testimony. I appreciate it very much. Um, as we consider this proposal before us, um, we have a, an ordinance that contemplates um, changes for Anchorage. It does not contemplate changes for Girdwood or uh, to the north and Eagle River and beyond. Um, do you think that we're looking too narrowly at the problem in Anchorage as a whole? Uh, do you think that we should be including all of Anchorage when we talk about housing? I'm just curious. Like all of the municipality? Correct. Um, I, I don't necessarily think um, this is overly narrow. I think there's a really unique aspect of the Anchorage Bowl and to expect that we can solve the housing problem in the Anchorage Bowl by um, increasing the supply of housing outside of the Anchorage Bowl is in my mind a little um, sh short-sighted because people can always commute in an hour from the valley, an hour from Girdwood, that sort of thing, but it's not actually addressing the problem here. And the fact is most people would rather live in a place where they don't have to drive an hour every way. And I think that addressing the problem where it is, is so important um, within Anchorage. And um, yeah, does that, does that answer your question? Addressing the problem where it is, I like that, thank you. No. No more questions, thank you. Okay, thank you.
Hello, my name is Emily Weiser, and I'm a homeowner in Airport Heights. Um, I'm here to testify in support of the home initiative. And I think one thing that maybe gets lost in the details sometimes is that the status quo is not working. Our current system is broken. It's not providing the housing that we need. So we can sit here all night and debate the details of this initiative, but I really want to keep in mind the spirit of it, which is to simplify zoning and make it more streamlined and make it easier to build housing, because that's what we need. It's pretty horrifying to, to talk to some of my friends who are really struggling to find housing, have unconventional or maybe even technically not legal arrangements for housing because they can't find or afford anything else. Um, in terms of more of the details of this initiative, I'd really like to encourage you to look at making sure that when zones are pooled, sticking with what's most flexible. So of the existing regulations, what's most flexible among that group and applying that, that largest flexibility to the rest of the zones that are being added into that group, which I think the, the draft and attachment for does do. So I support that. And then also, um, so in my neighborhood, Airport Heights, we have a number of threeplexes and fourplexes that were built before the current zoning regulations. If those were destroyed or demolished now, they would not be able to be rebuilt because threeplexes and fourplexes are not allowed in our zone. So I'd like to see those be allowed in the single and two family residential zone that's proposed by the home initiative. Um, I think that is also highlighted in the staff's planning report, the planning staff's report um, saying that, you know, we don't know if, if just allowing duplexes would be enough. That's not always enough to spur development. It doesn't always provide enough housing units. And considering that any any addition of housing would be through redevelopment of existing lots in the vast majority of the Anchorage Bowl. It's going to be piecemeal. It's going to be scattered. It's going to be just a sprinkle of new development or redevelopment. And so the more units we can provide in that sort of piecemeal redevelopment, the better in terms of adding more housing, which again is, is really the bottom line as far as I'm concerned. We need to add more housing. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And I see no questions. Next. Hello, my name is Keelan Kenny, and I'm here in representing the North Star area of Anchorage. I'm here because I support the home initiative because it's an opportunity to improve flexibility and increase simplicity in our, in our zoning code and will therefore help us address our housing crisis. This is very important to me both on a personal and a professional level. From a personal perspective, every single time when I interact with my friends throughout the week, it's often a reoccurring theme that there isn't enough housing, that they don't know where they're going to move to, or that they're not going to ever be able to afford to buy a home. I currently have a really good friend who's unfortunately having to move to Fairbanks simply because she can't afford to live here anymore. Professionally, I, work with, I often work with folks who are unhoused or are concerned about being evicted. We need more opportunities to build the types of housing that allow people to exist in and to enter into a housing market that provides more affordable options than what we have now. I would really urge you to think about, as we're, current, as we're addressing the housing crisis in Anchorage, how we want to help people re-enter into a housing market that at this time is incredibly strapped and inaccessible. The Home Initiative is going to help address this issue by expanding where more, ho more mobile homes are allowed and also in uh, having more access to duplexes. I would like to really kind of highlight what my peers have said that I also believe that we need more three and four plexes. We just need a more flexible market so the people who are re-entering after coming from a place of not being housed actually have an opportunity to get back on their feet after they're coming out of transitional housing programs. So I therefore wholeheartedly support HOME, and I really see it as a step towards addressing these issues. Thank you for your time. Question from Commissioner Krishna. Just, just a clarifying question. Uh, you yeah. said you were representing... Uh, oh, sorry, myself. Yourself. Okay, yes. thank you. Yes. Hello, please state your name. Good evening, my name is Patty Rothwell, and I'd like to start by saying thank you so much to the planning group. Thank you. Except you stole my thunder, because a lot of that was in here. <laughs> um, I'm here this evening to support 
suspending the 87S rezoning plan, and fund a 2050 comprehensive plan that would allow for public comment throughout the process. I also support the planning staff recommendations to focus the zoning changes on targeted infill and redevelopment with infrastructure and services. I was born here, raised my family in Sand Lake with single dwellings beside us, duplexes across the street, condos and townhouses backing up to my back fence, and a mini strip mall at the top of the street. That's literal. I could throw a stone to each one of those different housing situations. I love Anchorage. I retired here. I plan on staying to see my grandchildren start their families. So I have a vested interest in seeing our community revitalized with housing my grandchildren can one day afford. I would like to support a well thought out plan that would make that happen that came through our prescribed public process and is legal. This plan does not meet that criteria. We have no evidence area-wide rezoning would lower prices. Rezoning will not affect material, labor, land, transportation price increases, interest rates, or address the concerns about Alaska's economic uncertainty. Upgrades in required infrastructure to support the higher density could increase the cost to the home buyer as well as the rest of the community. These factors have either not been determined or revealed. Um, I was going to go into the legalities of how it doesn't meet the 2040, the 2020, Title 21, and the Hillside District Plan, but that's been well covered by them. But I would like to, to add that <clears throat> Anchorage can't be, it, it, it can't be homogenized. Not everybody wants the same thing. I think that the best thing for us would be for us to come up with affordable housing, more housing, but this plan is not going to res be resolving any of the issues that I mentioned earlier. I hope that we can put a plan together using the comprehensive plans updated and, and have everybody be able to come together without there being damage to the pre-existing neighborhoods. If you take every neighborhood and say that any neighbor could, had, could have a vast variety of things, somebody is going to be unhappy that they couldn't have the same neighborhood that they moved into 50 years ago with the anticipation of it having the same character. Thank you for listening to my comments tonight. Thank you. I see no questions. Good evening. My name is John Isaacs. I'm testifying on behalf of the Turnigan Community Council. Uh, I'm a council board member, co-chair of our land use committee. And the community council appreciates the opportunity to testify here tonight. Uh, we've submitted detailed comments that should be part of your supplemental packet. First, I want to say that we're a very active council and informed council, and we've been following housing issues for years and submitting comments to the commission and assembly. Our council understands the severity of the housing crisis. We need to take prompt but thoughtful action to solve it. This includes public process, and we appreciate the efforts that have been made by the assembly sponsors to reach out and start engaging the public on this. We support in concept reducing the number of residential zones from 13 to 5 and to make appropriate changes in the use tables and the dimensional standards. The devil's in the details. However, we request postponing commission action tonight based on the following observations. The assembly sponsors have indicated they'll be scheduling public meetings on the ordinance in April and May. It's appropriate to postpone action until after those meetings when the public has more time to get information on the proposal, to be able to ask questions and make informed comments to the commission. It's difficult for the average citizen to navigate municipal websites to find the information they need to process and provide comments. With a March 4th assembly webinar, March 11th deadline, the comments in the commission packet a hearing tonight with changing uh, information, there was not enough time for us to prepare to inform comments on the details. The first time we saw the initial details in the use tables and dimensional standards was a little over a week ago. And those are really kind of key pieces of this proposal in terms of what the impacts are. Um, again, there's just not enough time to review the material and work with our board and get um, and get some informed comments. We have some fundamental questions we'd like to be able to ask the sponsors. It seems unclear, based on staff reports and others, that if this proposed ordinance, if it constitutes area-wide zoning or not, and what the process for adopting this ordinance and making required changes to the 2020 comp plan and the 2040 land use plan will be. 
This is really one of the most significant and unaddressed issues, and it's reflected in the extensive and thoughtful comments by the planning staff. Um, the consolidation of the zones and the new use tables and dimensional standards is a complex proposal. There's a lot of unresolved issues, too little information on how this is going to be implemented and when, and how and when the public will be involved. It would be nice to have those details before you take action. We support consolidation of residential zoning districts and implementation of AO 2023-87 if it doesn't inordinately increase housing density through allowed uses and new dimensional standards. As long as the requirements of meeting 2040 land use plan and comprehensive plan are made with adequate community involvement, because Anchorage residents have put a lot of time into those two plans and they want to be involved in those changes. Um, Finally, we would like to see and be involved in the consolidation of the residential zones and the 2040 land use plan maps and zoning district maps. We feel strongly on this issue and there's really no detail about how and when that's going to occur. I have to say that providing information in a commission or assembly packet and being limited to sub submitting public comments and testimony does not really constitute adequate community involvement. We need the ability to work with the sponsors, ask questions, get answers, and have you know, some suggestions made. Um, but we feel the public process can be made more transparent and more deliberative without involving lengthening delays in addressing the critical need for more housing. You know, we, our council stays in, engaged, we want to be engaged in the process, and particularly I think we could come up with some solutions. Given that the commission has opened the public hearing tonight, our council requests that the public hearing be continued at a date after the assembly sponsors hold their public presentations in April, May, as indicated on the website. This will allow the public to be more informed, have a better understanding of the proposed zoning changes and compliance with the 2020 plan, the 2040 plan, and what the additional opportunities for public involvement of the process will be. Uh, we do recognize that those of us testifying tonight might not be able to testify again in the second hearing. So again, thank you very much for your consideration of this issue, and we um, encourage everyone to work on all the issues to address the housing crisis, including making more additional municipal lands available for residential development and making municipal investments in infrastructure that reduce development costs. Thank you. Thank you. I, I did hear, I have one question. I heard you say you support clustering the zoning as long as it does not increase any density, is that? In, inordinately increase. I think you'll see some comments in the packet, for example, where you had, um, it might have been one of the two municipal engineering comments which said if you increase the density too much, you increase them over what the capacity of the roads can support. And I know in our neighborhood, we've seen safety issues where you have on-site on parking has been forced onto the street and it's created safety. So I think these are some of the things we need to think about as we look at what are those density changes. We want more density, but it needs to be done thoughtfully, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm speaking for a group, Rabbit Creek Community Council as co-chair. Please state your name. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners, for this opportunity. My name is Ann Rappaport. We, the Rabbit Creek Community Council, have closely followed assembly initiatives to respond to Anchorage's housing shortage and are as concerned as anyone that people are leaving our great city and state because they can't afford housing and not that much housing has been constructed in recent years. Our members attended the Housing Summit Week in November. As a council, we routinely seek data and information on land use and planning from staff. We have carefully analyzed this proposal to upzone all of Anchorage and compared it to the 2020 Comp Plan, 2040 Land Use Plan, Hillside District Plan that covers our area, and the Anchorage Municipal Code Title 21 on rezoning. I'd like to give a shout out to the uh, Muni Planning Department for their careful analysis and excellent staff report. That report emphasizes many conclusions we had reached. It provides abundant reasons for you to delay action on 87S. We appreciate the recent public webinar and the offer of the sponsors to meet with community groups and we've scheduled a meeting with them next week. These continuing discussions that John mentioned also and another ordinance version all point to the need to take a pause and redirect. We ask that you provide direction for a comprehensive and collaborative public agency and assembly process and data gathering to determine updates and changes to the comp plan, land use plan, and Title 21 that could effectively, efficiently, and economically result in more housing and affordable housing. We voted at our April 
February 8th meeting to oppose implementation of 87S on a number of grounds. Most are also found in the planning department report. You have our detailed submittals. I'll summarize some of that opposition and provide some recommendations. 87S is not ready for a decision. There is no data demonstrating that current zoning constrains housing, nor is there information on how upzoning will affect existing transportation and other infrastructure or future costs and capacities. 87S fails to comply with many stated purposes of Title 21 planning and zoning. Title 21 was developed with a lot of public input and in conjunction with Muni planning staff. 87S is only now receiving such scrutiny and comment. Title 21 calls for efficient use of existing infrastructure, promoting development in city centers and infill areas for efficient travel, and promoting development that protects and enhances a variety of distinctive neighborhoods. Those same principles are touted by the Strong Towns Movement, by who the leader, Charles Marone, was invited to speak at the Housing Summit and again at the recent Alaska Design Forum. But those are not in 87S. 87S does not comply with either the 2040 Land Use Plan or 20. 20 comp plan. Please look at the recommended actions on the land use map uh, 3-1, the planning atlas map PZ-2, and the land use plan strategy number 6. These maps and language, explici language explicitly call for targeted rezoning, as does the comp plan. The comp plan cites design standards as an essential tool for compatible infill and for distinctive neighborhoods. Design standards are left to an unknown future by 87S. 87S does not comply with the Hillside District Plan or other neighborhood plans. For example, the Hillside Plan includes a carefully designed growth policy with strong justifications for varying residential zoning and density based on existing infrastructure and some of the specific features we have like on-site well and septic and natural hazards like slopes and soils. The HDP provides for selective infill in the lower hillside near existing infrastructure, but maintaining current zoning and densities in the central hillside and down zoning in a few parts of upper hillside, and also the conservation subdivision approach in sensitive areas. The planning department found 87S to be inconsistent with Title 21's rezoning procedures. We request a legal determination around this issue. We also recommend uh, that you suspend the 87S rezoning effort now and instead fund a 2050 comprehensive plan with broad public outreach and data-driven staff analysis. We would expect this to include all the pieces needed for a rezone, the design, dimensional, and development standards. I think some of those were just now coming out, so we haven't also had a chance to look at them. Um, but it would include the allowable uses and needed code and plan amendments. We ask that you encourage the assembly to convene builders, landowners, developers, lending institutions, nonprofits, and muni planning staff to drill down into the real barriers to building homes, and particularly affordable homes in Anchorage. Sure, the assembly can't do anything about high interest rates or the lack of skilled tradespeople or supply issues, but what incentives will encourage the targeted infill that's already identified in the 2040 plan? There's been tax incentives downtown that have led to several innovative combined housing commercial projects. The nonprofit Cook Inlet Housing Authority has constructed affordable housing in Spinard. How can those successes be duplicated? What codes can be simplified? How can the permitting process be streamlined but retain the standards that promote diverse, safe, and pleasant neighborhoods? Our written comments include some other specific recommendations I hope you'll also consider. Thank you for this opportunity. Your timing was really good. We got a question from Commissioner Eber. Um, yeah, I was just wondering why you support funding a 2050 plan versus just revising the 2040 plan. Because, well, the comprehensive plans are supposed to be updated every 10 years, and it's been more than 10 years, so it would make, it, it seems that, you know, if we look at our past plans and processes, it's timely to do that. Um, if we can do it by, modif by updating the 2040 plan, you know, that might be another way. Maybe it's what we end up calling it, but the process that needs to be done is to just really convene everybody, have the public process, and start looking, you know, at all these specifics um, and what, what it, you know, the, the planners meet with builders regularly. So what are they hearing the complaints about that are, you know, causing them not to build or that are increasing their costs? We need to look at those kinds of things and see what we can do about them. Thank you. Thank see you. no more questions. Thank you. Please state your name and if you're speaking for yourself or for a group. Hello, my name is Adam Lees. I'm speaking for the University Area Community Council. Um, our community council on March 6th voted over 90% to oppose this case moving forward. 
Um, we s also struggle to find good data or information about this case. Uh, former presenters saying that it is difficult to navigate uni websites stated a bit of an understatement, to say the least. Um, however, we did discover Rabbit Creek Community Council's comments. Uh, we invited them to present at that March 6th meeting, and upon that, this vote was taken. And we have signed on to Rabbit Creek's Community Councils, given that we would not have had the time to submit very detailed uh, comments ourselves. That said, we do want to emphasize that we also appreciate that the Assembly is actually taking a look into a very serious situation with housing in our community. Um, we are very much in support of the goal of trying to build more housing, more affordable housing, um, and better neighborhoods. And I'm saying this as someone who is a renter. I've been a long-term renter. As the price of housing has just blown up in Anchorage, I have removed myself from the potential buyer's market because it is just well beyond my means to afford. Most of my living right now is as a delivery driver. It's very satisfying work. It is not that great with the ice, but it is not something with the average house now going over $400,000 that I have any ability to look for in the future. We've heard a great bit about the legal questions. Our community council was extremely concerned with this. We also believe in a very robust public process and the potential that this was not being followed was of great concern to the council. And we are also concerned that should this lead to prolonged litigation, this would just further drain municipal coffers and we have already had enough of useless spending on bad lawsuits that could have been avoided. There's also a concern in our area because we were never able to be given very clear impacts in our own area, one of which is covered by the UMED neighborhood plan, of the potential impacts of this upzoning and changes. We're especially concerned because most of the roads around the area are very tight. They are not meant to be arterials or collectors. Um, some are going through very extensive repairs right now. And with parking and off-site and such restrictions having been recently removed by a reform, we're very concerned that those small streets could be easily overwhelmed because this is still a driving city. Um, even with people mover moving at full capacity, it doesn't serve huge chunks of streets in my area. And the whole point of the comprehensive plan was to try and line up these denser developments with um, existing infrastructure, or to plan infrastructure as well. This was the assertion back when Mayor Berkowitz was in office, when People's Movers' whole structure was changed to the kind of hub and spokes model that it currently has, with some targeting toward a uh, town center in Northeast Anchorage uh, centered around the Muldoon Corridor. Um, the main issue my council has found, it was a, I'd say the primary reason for its opposition to this case and, to, and its support in signing on to Rabbit Creek Community Council's comments is that we haven't been provided with any data, certainly no robust data, um, that shows that this sort of rezoning would address the problem or what kind of inputs have been happening. I did read the sponsor's replies to staff's report. I was able to read most of staff's report and hopefully you could understand it. And it doesn't seem that the data being used to make the assertions can actually stand up to a scrutiny about what is causing the data to be described. Um, I can speak only personally on this particular experience, but as I said, I've removed myself from the potential buying market because financing is extraordinarily difficult. Um, at this point in Alaska, I'm sure many of you know, Alaska Housing Finance Corporation is moving toward being the majority uh, generator of mortgages in the state. It's a massive increase from where it usually went because commercially available mortgages, even very affordable ones relatively from local credit unions, are just not supportive. Um, and that's not to say that most of the housing stock in Anchorage was built in the 70s and 80s. It's in desperate need of renovation. The fact that you're asking me to force fork up 20% as a down payment, and then making sure I can hold the mortgage, but also then getting a house that is straight out of 1981 that could have no end of potential structural problems that are tens of thousands of dollars more to fix. And even with programs that help provide some funds for renovations and a loan, you're still dealing with that uncertainty. We're dealing with a rental market that is also extraordinarily condensed in one or two mega landlords that can charge exorbitant amounts for very substandard properties. And all this, our council very much requests that you postpone this and do not support it because we are looking for a more robust process and we are looking for far more robust and specific data before we can change our uh, council's opinion. Thank you. I see no questions. Anybody else wishing to speak?
just have to. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Please state your name. And if you're testifying for yourself or a group. Yeah. So. Thank you. I'm Diane Holmes. And as I prepare to downsize, I want housing in neighborhoods that have retained their character with infrastructure suited for the elderly. No one is against more housing. The 2040 lays out areas zoned for growth. Many neighborhood plans, even the HDP, designate such areas. Is higher density being developed there, Mr. Spinelli? <laughs> now that three and four plexes can be built under residential code, are we likely to see more affordable housing? Remember, ADUs can double our density technically in today. Upzoning across the U.S. is too new for adequate data to determine if more unaffordable housing has resulted. But initial data are not encouraging. Some statistics show that new construction is never affordable. No mistake, this is a bowl-wide rezoning. But why not promote growth in these 2040 designated areas and then take time to revise our land use plans legally and with adequate public input? This well-meaning AO has been a moving target for residents and poorly understood by everyone. Even an assembly member told one council incorrectly that it would not affect them. There's no evidence this A will produce more housing. Yet, we all hear the desire for it with the belief it is a panacea. The sponsors are aware, were aware long ago that their text amendment to Title 21 was an illegal path to rezoning the incredible staff report lays out that this in no uncertain terms, as you have heard before. We must change the land use plans before the implementation can occur through Title 21. If the sponsors had followed this advice last summer, just think how far ahead we would be into legally updating our land use plans without potential legal action. But there is nothing legal the way this AO has come before you. Neither has there been an adequate public process because it predisposes. There will be five zoning districts, among other things. To me, it is rather shameful the amount of resources that have spent on this flawed AO. Cost to the planning department, the city legal, not to mention citizens' time, like mine. I suspect if you vote if your vote were to hinge on one thing, it should be the legality of this. I trust you have the city attorney's opinion. Please consider planning's in-depth recommendation and honor the public process and our land use plans. Thank you. I see no questions. I'm glad this was adjusted for people that are less than five foot tall. <clears throat> My name is Eleanor Andrews, and I'm representing myself and about 10 neighbors in the South Edition Community Council. I don't need more than three minutes. Uh, when I found out about what was going on with these ordinances to rezone and remap Anchorage, I came to it late in a November Community Council meeting. So I left the meeting and I said, well, let's see if we can get a delay. I went and talked to my assembly person, Dan Volan, who lives in my neighborhood. And guess what? Neither one of our blocks is an R2M. Anyway, I said, why the rush? What's going on? He says, well, our builders need to know now so they can get in the ground this year. I said, unless they found money that I don't know about, you can't get money now to build unproven housing in different places. The banks are very conservative. <clears throat> so. We went back and forth about what it would do. I kept asking for delays. So I had about eight to 10 people meet at my house three times a week, two to three hours at a time, to talk about what this is, why is it happening, 
What does it mean? We came to the conclusion that we needed a paralegal and a planning person to understand this information that was coming to us like a fire hose. I'm a former bureaucrat. I was commissioner of administration for the state of Alaska, a business owner for 20 years, and was on the neighborhood housing board for 12 years. And we built or rehabbed 1,200 affordable units all over Anchorage. We kept panoramic view on Government Hill from being torn down. <coughs> Excuse me. We built Spruce out on Lake Otis, Hampstead Heath on the old Seward Highway, and we did it right. We took the village off Rika and took those torn down apartments, rehabbed them, and sold them to the residents as their first home. Housing development didn't hinge or get started with zoning or rezoning. It was all about citizen ascertainment, what do the people want, and you find that out by public hearings, and then you got to have the money. And the reason Cooklet in it can do it now, and we could do it then, because it was federal money. There were tax credits. If we had the tax credit credit program now that we had then, we wouldn't have to make up stuff about why builders can't build. It's unaffordable for lots of reasons, but I've not seen one piece of information, nothing but anecdotal things that are very sincere, I believe, the people speaking, but nothing to support that zoning is going to make housing more available. When I asked my assembly person what it was for, he said, well, the young professionals need to come downtown. I said, listen, I've been here. I've had five homes in Anchorage. I wanted to live in Bootleggers Cove like we do now, but I started near Port Heights. So I just don't think that you have to disenfranchise anybody, but be smart. Make your decisions based on facts that are supportable, or I'm not threatening lawsuit, but I know government. And unless you get this wrapped up, you're going to keep hearing from people till it gets right. Thank you. Um, com question coming in. Commissioner Krishna. Do you have specific recommendations? I'm the, sorry, your voice is... <laughs> do you have specific recommendations for how you would like to see this commission change this proposed ordinance or yeah. recommend changes? Um, I believe in good government and public process. From everything I've seen, this has all been backwards. We didn't come up with 2020 and 2040 by the assembly going away with housing enthusiasts, enthusiasts and consultants and developers and having private meetings for a year and saying, oh, I got something for you. You got to have a public process and you have to take what you're coming up with to the planning department, to the legal department, and get those questions answered before something even comes to planning and zoning. It's all been backwards. And I predict it's not going to go very far. Thank you. OK. Good evening. My name is Martin Hansen. I'm speaking uh, for myself. Home ownership is precious. It gives us financial and emotional security. Zoning protects those values. This initiative is going to jerk the rug right out from under that security. I live on a small street. It's narrow. It's inlet place. Most of the winter, the few cars that park on the street, because most of the houses have on, you know, on-site parking, most of the winter, that street has been moderately passable. We we'll always cross our fingers on the day that the garbage trucks come by and hope that there's room for them. All it's going to take is one fourplex with eight vehicles out on the street to make our street impossible. And that is going to be true for every small street neighborhood in Anchorage. There's going to be safety implications, and I don't know how those parents are going to get their kids in the school if you allow this to go through. And please don't make any mistakes. Don't play word games with me. This is a rezone. And it's going to affect everybody. And it's not going to affect them well. And I question the basic assumption that we need to remove the protection that zoning provides in order to provide affordable housing. Anchorage population, as we all know, is dwindling. It's going down. The Anchorage School District has six schools on its list that they propose to close. 
this existing housing will become available as people leave. It took years, years of serious public process to develop our land use plans and zones. Uh, and I see an attempt to wipe that away without any clear evidence that, the, that in the current economy we can build affordable new housing. I think that's sad, but I think that is the case. The way to the home initiative is so broad, way broad brush that I would love to see you come back and show me individual parcels and areas that can, can be developed and work on those rather than uh, sweeping everybody into the same trash can. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi there. My name is Deborah Hansen. I'm testifying for myself. I'd like to note that Eleanor Andrews stole my speech. Um, so I'm going to have to talk a little bit about some personal stuff. Um, a little bit of history lesson. I worked for Alan Teshi, and he was the guy from the municipal attorney's office who was responsible for closing the gravel pits. I don't know if you remember the Sand Lake gravel pit or the one off of Lake Otis and 15th and how dusty Anchorage was. When those gravel pits closed, people said, you are ruining housing in Anchorage because where are we going to get the gravel from? Well, we all know that all worked out just great because I ended up working for the Alaska Railroad with Anchorage Sand and Gravel and a predecessor of the company now that brings gravel in. Anyway, I'd like to say... Anchorage is better for having closed gravel pits. Anchorage is better for having Title 21. I moved up here in 82, and it, Anchorage looks a lot better. It's a lot more livable place. I love our neighborhood. I'd like to keep living there. I'm not real excited about um, having off-street, or uh, not having off-street parking. Uh, we have a narrow street. My husband testified. Our son had, had a very bad accident years ago. If we had as many cars parking on inlet places as there are now with the Airbnbs and all, the emergency vehicles could not have gotten on the street and saved his life. And that's something I think that everyone needs to think about personally when you're rezoning. You, by the way, are rezoning my house. Uh, we're an R2M house. I think the assembly rezoned it in December uh, because we're on 6,000 square feet. Uh, and when I bought it, I felt we were pretty safe with the whole thing because it called for 8,000 square feet. What you're doing in the South Edition, you're going to rezone over 1,000 lots. That's a rezone. And I think, as Eleanor mentioned, you're going to have legal problems if you proceed with this. So I really urge you to postpone it. Swinging a wrecking ball through the Anchorage zoning and Title 21 and pretending that you're not is a mistake. Every neighbor I've spoken with in the last two weeks did not know this was going on and are opposed to it or wants to give input. And there hasn't been a lot of opportunity for input. The March 4th webinar was nice. Um, they took a couple questions. And even on the South Edition Community Council special meeting last week, there were a couple questions. But you're not getting questions answered. I sat through those Title 21 meetings back in the 80s and hours and hours and hours of frankly boring testimony. But that's how the public gets involved. You don't want to have everybody hate you and hate the assembly. We want stuff to work. This is a good government. We need housing here, but we need to do it right. And I appreciate your attention. I sure hope you postpone this. Thank you. Hello, my name is Duncan Fisher. I'm speaking on behalf of myself. Um, the purpose of a system is what it does. If we take that to be true, then the purpose of planning and zoning in Anchorage is to restrict housing supply. We have, if you look at a graph of our new homes built, it's been really low for over 10 years. We built about 3,000 homes per year for a couple years in the 80s and have slowed and stopped nearly zero. There's very little space for infill development in town. Um, on greenfields, sorry, very, very little space for greenfield development and most of our new development is going to come from infill. Um, there's been a lot of talk up here about the comprehensive plan. I think it's good to note for people that there is no single comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan for people who don't know is 50 plus different individual plans, each of which includes a neighborhood plan which has its own opportunities for public input. All of the community councils get to make their own neighborhood plan and each of those plans is part of that general plan. Um, so to say that there hasn't been public input in the 2040 plan or this is a little ridiculous. Um, 
That being said, the more public input you have on any topic, and I'm sure planning and zoning knows more than anybody that you get people coming to these for the smallest things, for somebody adding a sidewalk to their house, somebody wanting to have their cul-de-sac have no sidewalk on one side because there's going to be a lot of cars. All of these things are just minutia that are not going to, that are always going to have the effect of limiting what can be built. And that's what the home initiative is aiming to change. The, uh, from this, like the goal is just to increase the ability of buy right development, because that's really where housing is getting built, is buy right development. You're not building on a lot where you need two special limitations and you have to have a sun study or anything like that. We have to be able to build like we used to build all over, wherever, why not? Like, you don't, if you live in a, there's no compact that says you have a right to a, if you bought a single family detached home, that you have a right to always live in a neighborhood of single family detached homes. You own your property and your property rights, for the most part, stop at your property line. There are obvious externalities that must be controlled, noxious uses, you're not gonna live next to a refinery. But we have lots of controls on that already. To say that density is a, I've heard lots of comments like people saying, who is going to bear the burden of density? That's a little absurd. There's the densest places in the world are some of the most beautiful places. Barcelona has 50,000 people for, per square kilometer and very few cars and is great for it. We don't have, to, I understand that we're a winter city and people drive a lot, but the same thing with saying that limiting uh, or removing parking requirements is going to fill the streets with cars. It's not. Developers are still going to build parking on in buildings. We're, it's going to be incremental. I'd strongly advise you to please pass uh, 87 in its S version as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to testify? Invite the petitioner back up for rebuttal. design podium okay thank you um, so I appreciate all of the engagement here this evening um, I want to start out by reminding us that what home stands for and why we deliberately name this the home initiative it's the housing opportunities in the municipality for everyone it's not just about preserving those who currently have housing um, and have housing that they like. It is ensuring that there is housing to meet everyone's needs. And currently, we can't do that under our um, current scheme. Now, what is, you know, I want you to ask yourselves, what is the opportunity cost of doing nothing? We had um, from staff mention when the land use plan was last updated, but nothing's really happened since. So just sticking by the same old documents isn't working. Um, so I ask you, what is our priority? What are we trying to achieve here? We're trying to achieve another tool in the toolbox to increase housing. And <clears throat> we had some conversations about, well, will this increase housing? Will it reduce the cost? I will tell you that we have heard over and over every time a developer has to come for a rezone that it's not only the monetary cost, but it's the uncertainty, delay, and opportunity costs that really puts a property in jeopardy of being developed. Additionally, there's the opportunity cost for adaptive reuse. We often think about development as from the ground up, but what about the houses we have sitting available today? that um, are housing less people. The average size of a family is decreased, but houses are larger. Additionally, we need to acknowledge the housing reality. I live in a single family R1 neighborhood. Of the six houses around me, only half of them are truly single family anymore. They are just not being used that way. Our code should reflect our reality. All of that said, you have choices before you, and we've spelled out some of those. You can recommend um, approving you know, the S for approval with the details, but what I really want to put forward is what I think is a compromise position. 
I would ask that the Planning and Zoning Commission delay this for 60 days to your meeting of May 20th for the sponsors and the department to bring back to you a full package, a comp plan amendment, a land use plan amendment, which would have to be published to the public by April 29th. Um, any tweaks to those details, that draft detail document, explore expanding the single two-family zoning to include three and four plexes. That, make, that single family zone takes up 46% of our current zoning. So let's explore that. I'm hearing a lot of opportunity. And so I think that that is a way forward without considerable delay. Keep the urgency, keep the fire, keep us on task, please. And in the meantime, we can have the lawyers get together to reconcile the notice issue. Um, you know, what's the best way to figure out an issue between two lawyers is put them in the same room until they come up with whatever the solution needs to be to move forward. Um, finally, um, you know, it doesn't affect too much what the assembly process is. It will allow us to continue, you know, as the sponsors with our engagement plan. Um, and it would necessitate a postponement of the current scheduled um, assembly public hearing, but only by two weeks. So it really does kind of keep that general expectation we're moving on that timeline. Overall, I think that it's really important not to be paralyzed by the complexity of this issue, that um, keeping it at the why, the what, and the how. The why is we need housing. The what is this piece among many, and how is in the details in that document. And it is a lot to ask this commission to reconcile all of those things and the staff report in our position. So ask us to go back and do it together. But keep us on a tight timeline, please. Um, the final things I want to say is that this isn't about throwing out design standards or the parts of Title 21 that work. A lot is preserved here. Um, and so I think a lot of the concerns are um, just a lack of understanding. And continued community engagement will help bring that along. And we need to ensure that community engagement occurs within the processes so that we can actually get to decisions and make change in our community to try things. If we are constantly in a, um, constantly in a revision period to every public comment received over and over again, um, we never move forward to try something. And I think the biggest failure for us will be to do nothing. Nothing isn't an option at this point. Um, and so we would like to work collaboratively with the department and the administration um, with your guidance on what you would like to see and on your timeline. I think that is a um, recipe for success um, that really accomplishes that housing opportunities in the municipality for everyone. Thank you. Do you either, I have a minute, do you guys wanna jump in? Okay. I wouldn't want to cede the time with co-sponsors without not checking. Thank you. OK, uh, question from Commissioner Pullis. Just thinking outside the box and not wanting to hit reset on all your guys' hard work, did you guys ever consider just trying to get in what you're trying to get in into the current zoning, you know, classifications because like the middle housing and all that kind of stuff I feel like all that stuff's going to happen in targeted areas no matter what we do so if we could figure those areas out and put those in those areas you know maybe there wouldn't be as much pushback so I think that's part of the answer and we've done a lot of that work but it doesn't take care of um, you know uh, adaptive reuse of a single family home right it, it's limited to just where three and four plexes can be and that's one part of the solution is that missing middle but it's not the only parts of the solution and I look at our current zoning code with the 15 zones built like a crazy Dr. Seuss house with a special limitation here and an A here and something else here. This is the idea to kind of reset that table, get us a more modern streamlined version that we can hopefully not have to have these wonky add-ons moving forward. So it's a two-fold process. Any further questions for the petitioner or for staff?
Commissioner George. Thank you. Through the chair, a question for the petitioner. I, <clears throat> during the testimony, I had asked a question of one of the speakers that I neglected to give you the opportunity to also uh, weigh in on. And so uh, in order to rectify that, I figured I would uh, take the opportunity to talk about um, why this ordinance is targeted specifically to the Anchorage Bowl and not to uh, Chugach Eagle River North or Girdwood South. And one of the things that the testifier said really made a lot of sense to me, which is to solve the problem where it is. But I can't help forgetting the last two years I heard about how much Girdwood needs housing and, uh, and why aren't they part of this, this solution? Yeah, um, fair. And it's a very fair question. So Girdwood has its own comp plan as does Eagle River. Like, great. So they have separate systems. So we thought we would start where the problem is and frankly, in our literal own backyards. We represent the bull. And so that is why we are starting here. We fully acknowledge that Girdwood has um, a housing crisis, an acute version that's very special to Girdwood. Um, and their density requirements already in Girdwood are higher than in a lot of neighborhoods in Anchorage already as well. When you look at how they are set up, um, they already pretty much allow duplexes nearly everywhere and things like that. So they're not starting from that same position where 46% of their zoning is single family zoning. So, right, we're starting from where we're at. Anna, go ahead. Yeah, and I'll just briefly add, to my knowledge, um, the Chugaki River plan was uh, appro approved in 2006, and the Girdwood plan is from the 90s, but they are currently in the process of updating their plan, and so, and I know that housing has been a huge discussion there, and so again, with the idea that um, zoning should follow plans, um, I think it's really up to the Chugach Eagle River community when they would like to update their plan and have that, that conversation. Um, we do know that when uh, members of the assembly brought that conversation uh, area-wide last year, there was a lot of um, pushback, and so again, to the idea that um, it needs to involve the community, I think that's a question to ask the Eagle River community and the Girdwood community. Thank you. Um, I see no questions in the queue. Uh, I have a question for staff. The petitioners have requested that we delay. The public hearing is currently still open. Do you, would you like to comment on your views on that or how we could, can we leave the public hearing open and move to delay now? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, so it's a mechanical question, right? Where you're wondering when, when is it appropriate to close the public hearing? Um, and it's a great question and I'll be honest, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I believe you could reopen the public hearing, but it'd have to be due to new evidence or changed circumstances. But I, by no means an expert on this, um, so I would defer to uh, the clerk or some of the assembly members are actually pretty good with this stuff too, so um, they may know. Thank you. Um, so. Um, Assembly items that have public hearing, we can move to continue the public hearing to a date certain. And so it, the public hearing remains open. Um, and in assembly rules, if there is then a substitute version or additional new information that wasn't available for the prior public hearing, people who've previously testified can testify on that new substitute version as to the changes, or in this case, potentially the comp plan and land use plan amendments that would be brought forward. So while you're here, typically I would close the public hearing and then we would make motions. Are, would we do this before closing the public hearing? So the other option is you could close the public hearing in order to make motions, but um, if I were sitting in your chair, I would move to continue the public hearing to May 20th for purposes of and then any other instructions you so wanted to give. Let me ask you one other question. I believe we might have three public hearings on May 20th. Would we still want to go that date or is there another date that you think might work? So I picked May 20th because we, for the comp plan and land use plan amendments, you have to have 21 days notice. Um, and so that would have been April 29th. Um, if we push out to the first meeting in June, we start to push the, um, the assembly process even further out. Um, I think we actually get into the first meeting in July. 
um, and July, as we know, is a um, uncertain time in the municipality during an election year. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Davis. Yes, thank you. Uh, just adding to the uh, point regarding uh, bringing forward amendments uh, to the comprehensive plan that does require a public process, and so we would release those public hearing draft comprehensive plan amendments uh, for a public review period uh, before, uh, before bringing that case to the commission. Thank you. Is, I guess now we'll open it up to the commission prior to closing public hearing. Is anybody feeling like they want to make a motion to postpone? Just a point of order. Um, under our uh, code, I believe it's under the text amendments procedure AMC 2103-210B, but I may be mistaken. Um, we may have to uh, take action or the item is back before the assembly within 60 days unless we request an extension is my understanding um, And so if appropriate, I would be willing to make a motion to include the request to the assembly for an extension um, If the body feels that's appropriate and I'll maybe defer to the staff it was mentioned in the uh, In the staff report the procedures for how the Planning and Zoning Commission re reviews items sent to it from the assembly Uh, yes, we may have to look at the code uh, just really quick like, but in general, uh, there is a point at which uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, uh, the assembly uh, would be, uh, w would have the uh, liberty to move forward with the amendments uh, after a certain 60 day period, unless the Planning and Zoning Commission does request an extension. So. Uh, they may have to quickly run to Title 21 and give you a clear answer to that, but there is a there's a 60-day time point at which the assembly could move forward, unless the commission requests an extension. Just let us check on that. I guess while Tom checks on that, I would just mention that the um, sponsors at the assembly are here telling asking us to delay. So I don't. I think we need to worry about them running away with it. But um, is it, anybody else have anything to add? Commissioner Garner. Thank you. Um, I guess another question, just procedurally for the planning department. Um, you know, Tom, you, re you referenced the need for um, notice in advance of any changes to the comprehensive plan. And I wasn't clear if you were suggesting that that is somehow in conflict with the proposed. Uh, timeline that we're talking about here with the 60 days um, or not what was your what was there something further I guess you were trying to say there uh, yes thank you uh, so uh, yes you, you have a, a comprehensive plan amendment would be a separate case that we would bring forward to the Planning and Zoning Commission obviously can be concurrent with uh, the um, uh, changed amendments or the revised ordinance uh, for the text amendment to Title 21. And uh, uh, honestly, I, I, I to do the math, but there's a possibility there, uh, you know, not, to, not to be a, a downer, but to uh, just to make sure that uh, we can carry out what uh, we're thinking of. But uh, there would be a time period at which we would need to uh, work together to develop uh, some amendments to the comp plan, uh, agreed upon uh, proposal, uh, bring that out. You know, ideally a comprehensive plan amendment uh, like, uh, you know, like that, the policy uh, 1.8 of the land use plan map recommends that it be a process to engage the, the public. And so it's, it could be more than a matter of, you know, uh, bringing out a public hearing draft, you know, with the minimum public review period saying, here it is, you know, here's your month and a half or whatnot to review it, but uh, it's to meaningfully engage
the public in a process of determining those. Uh, but uh, even the, the minimum time period, uh, we'd want to check and make sure we could carry out what we're you know, committing ourselves to. So check on that as well while I check on the other question. <laughs> Sorry. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Krishna. Sure, just to the department, I, I think as we move forward with a postponement, I would also like to request a, another work session in 30 days. We didn't get to talk about special limitations or floor area ratio or the bonus table. Um, and uh, it's, I think it'll be too hard to do so at a meeting or in the hour before a meeting. So I think we need um, some time outside of these scheduled meetings and our, our other commission business to really dig into um, all the provisions in this ordinance and um, have some time to ask for the information we need to provide good recommendations. Mr. Yell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna turn the floor over to my uh, colleague in the municipal attorney's office. Uh, She's just having some technical difficulties, so I'm hitting the request to speak button for her. Um, I'm doing quick code research to try to answer your questions about the process required to consider um, to have comprehensive plan amendments come before this body, and I wouldn't say I have the perfect, succinct answer yet, but this would be governed by Title 21.03.070, um, and the big requirements from the um, notice requirement table in Chapter 21 are published notice and notice to community councils. Um, but this procedure requires um, so substantive amendments to be considered by the Planning and Zoning Commission shall be available for public review at least 21 days in advance of the public hearing before this body. And then there also needs to be departmental review, a chance for the planning department to review, and they, per code, must, um, shall provide um, a report to you all. Uh, and then, um, then the assembly, after you uh, have made your recommendation, then the assembly notice procedures kick in, which I believe is well, we know that there's also a kind of a period where the public must have time to consider that before their chance to testify in front of the assembly. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just following up on uh, uh, Commissioner George's question regarding the, uh, the need to uh, request an extension after 60 days, 
Um, so this would be a, a request by the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, to request an extension uh, uh, for it to take action on uh, this case, the text amendment, uh, to give it more time to take action. And you make that request to the assembly. So the code reads that uh, as soon as possible after the public hearing, but no later than 60 days, the Planning and Zoning Commission shall make a recommendation to the assembly to approve or deny the text amendment uh, based on the approval criteria. Uh, if no recommendation is made within 60 days, then the Planning and Zoning Commission may request an extension of time from the assembly to take action. They don't need to request an extension today. Uh, the commission could uh, request at uh, a later date to, to, to extend. Um, so they wouldn't need to, to, to uh, make that request tonight. Um, Is, did I hear it correctly that it's after the close of public hearing? Uh, that's correct, thank you. We're going to have a five-minute recess for staff. Okay, a motion by Commissioner Krishna. Would you like to state your motion? Sure, I move to continue the public hearing in case 2024-0006 to May 20th, uh, 2024 to allow the Anchorage Assembly to revise the public, hear public hearing draft of the Home Initiative Ordinance, uh, including the recommended actions shown on page 33 of the March 18th, 2024 staff report, and to reopen the public hearing before the Planning and Zoning Commission oh, and to continue the public hearing. That is seconded by Commissioner Eber. Commissioner Krishna, would you like to speak to your motion? Um, I, I intend to support the motion. Anyone else wishing to speak to the motion? Now would be the time where you would add comments of what you might or expect to see in the next 60 days. Commissioner Gardner. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> um, I intend to support the motion as well. I just wanted to note, um, I, I guess as a request with reference to the work session, I recognize we're kind of operating under a pretty tight timeline here, but to the extent at all possible, I think it would be helpful for us if that could be held sometime other than um, immediately before the, um, the proposed May 20th um, continuation date. And um, speaking for myself as well, just in terms, I, I know there was a request um, from the sponsors for input on um, potential topics we might be interested in hearing more about. And um, I am curious um, 
to see if there's any input with respect to the availability of three and four plexes and when and how that may make sense to include. And also for myself, I was curious to learn more about, um, I know one of the concerns in the staff packet was removal of some minimum um, residential requirements in some of the zones, um, which were not included, and to understand exactly a little further the thinking um, on that and specifically kind of what interests are being served um, by removing some of those minimum requirements. Anyone else wishing to speak to the motion? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. Mr. Strike, how do you vote? Yep. Thank you. That motion passes. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Moved by Commissioner Eber, seconded by Commissioner Winchester. Any opposition to that motion? Hearing none, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strike. <laughs>